here is dealing with a similar type of thing. So we were talking during lunch about this. And really, I, it was just the same thing. The same thing that set John free is the same thing that'll set Mike free. It's the same thing that'll set Sue free or Fred free or anybody else. God is no respecter of persons. It's not like God just looks down and says, all right, I'll heal this person, but not this one. It, uh, faith operates by laws. It's like electricity. Electricity doesn't just choose to kill one person and not kill another. Somebody violates those laws. There are laws that governs how electricity flows and there are laws that govern how faith works and how the power of God works. And this is what I've been teaching on is the fear of God. The fear of God is one of the things that releases the power of God. God loves everybody regardless of what we do or don't do. He is a gracious God. He's a kind God. You can see so many examples of this in the word where he just reached out and touched people and stuff. God wants nothing but good for every single one of us. But electricity doesn't flow through wood the same as it flows through copper. There are laws that govern what allows the power of God to flow. And there are things that inhibit the power of God in your life. What Billy was talking about, about the difference between manna and having the fruit of the land, that is powerful. God established these natural laws and we have to learn what they are. You can't just expect supernatural things. Now God can do that and there are examples of it. And if you're in a situation where you're just a week away from dying, you may not have any other options but to just get a supernatural healing. But God's best is for you to learn the ways of God and cooperate with him so that the power of God just flows in your life. It's actually better to get healed under the blessing of God than it is to get healed under a miracle. A miracle determines that you have to have a crisis before you get a miracle. Whereas a blessing will prevent crisis in your life. A miracle is short term. It's never going to be forever. God does not want you to live from miracle to miracle. It's just a temporary fix. Whereas a blessing, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he has no sorrow with it. So anyway, I could go on and on. I just happen to have a teaching on that entitled Blessings and Miracles. But you have to cooperate with God. And one of the things that allows you to do that is to get this fear of God to where you honor God, you reverence God, you exalt his word and you love him, trust him more than you trust any person or anything else. Do you know the only people that will ever let you down are the ones that you lean on. And if you're saying that you're just broken hearted that somebody's disappointed you, it's because you leaned on that person. It's because they had an inroad into your life. And although we ought to love other people, we ought to love them from a position of strength where I don't have to have your approval to survive. I love you and want to minister to you because I believe that that's what God would have me to do and because I care about you, but I don't have to have your acceptance. You need to get to where the only person that you are totally dependent upon is God. And that's just another way of saying what I'm calling the fear of God. You need to get to where God is your source, your only source. He's all that you need and you acknowledge that he can flow through people and so you will receive through people and stuff, but it's God that is your source and you aren't dependent upon man. I'm on page 10 of my 17 pages and I'm not going to finish. So I went through and just checked a few of the ones that I wanted to, uh, focus on. And so this is going to be just picking and choosing a few of the verses left. I would encourage you to do a study on this. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 21 says, my son, fear thou the Lord and the King and meddle not with them that are given to change. We could spend a whole service on this, but did you know people that don't fear God? If you don't have a fixed, uh, unchangeable source of right and wrong truth. Well, then you are unstable. And the Bible says an unstable man is not going to receive anything of the Lord. And today I would say that the majority of people have situational ethics or relativism. It just depends on which way the wind is blowing, what the 
what society is like and stuff. And to most people, there are no absolutes. You will often hear this, that, well, what's true for you or what's reality for you may not be reality for me. That's just a bunch of foolishness. Well, you know, I was born a man, but I feel like a woman today. That is absolute foolishness. But see, there's people that don't have any stability in their life. And it says, don't meddle with those that are given to change. This word meddle here is talking about having interaction, being entwined with them. It would be similar to what the New Testament says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe it's around verse 14, when it says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We should be influencing other people. We should not let them influence us. But most Christians today are more influenced by the world than we are influencing the world. We pay hundreds of dollars a month to have ungodliness pumped into our house. You sit down and watch adultery, lying, stealing, homosexuality, every type of perversion that you can imagine. You hear all of this ungodliness and stuff and we meddle with those that are given to change. We let them have an influence in our life. I tell you, the fear of God, you're going to have to put establish that there are right and wrongs and you establish your life on this and you just control your life by it. And you don't meddle with those that are given to change. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, uh, man, I wish I had time to summarize the whole book of Ecclesiastes. I'm not sure I could do it. Ecclesiastes is one of the hardest books in the Bible for me. And I believe it's because Solomon is the one who wrote it. And he says in the beginning, vanity of vanity, all is vanity, thus saith the preacher. And he just puts out all of these terrible statements. And Solomon was the wisest man on the earth. He was the richest man that has ever lived or will ever live, it says in 2 Chronicles. And God is the one that gave him his wisdom. But as he grew older, he violated the word of God. This is one of the points that I want to make today in some of these other scriptures I get to. There were scriptures in the book of Deuteronomy that says when it was the Lord speaking through Moses, that when you reject me and you put a king in over you and God knew it was going to happen, but he said that wasn't his will. He says, when you do that, Make sure that he does not multiply to himself wives because his wives will turn his heart away from me. That was a command. Solomon ignored that. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And in the end of his life, he built uh, altars for his wives, pagan gods, and he began to be an idol worshiper. You can read about this, 1 Kings chapter 11. And God appeared unto him twice in dreams and wound up rejecting Solomon. Solomon's the guy that wrote the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. But in the book of Ecclesiastes, it was towards the end of his life. And he said, I just decided to give myself to myrrh and to wine and to indulge every appetite. And he says, nobody could indulge themselves the way I could. He was the richest man. They actually took silver and threw it on the ground because silver was useless in his day. Everything was made out of gold. He had wealth like none of us have ever imagined. Any of these Arab sheiks and stuff that, you know, became rich through oil, it says in 2 Chronicles, I believe it's chapter 1, that there will never be another person as rich as Solomon. Solomon was rich. He had all of these things. And because of it, he just indulged every lust. And the whole book of Ecclesiastes is him just talking about there's no point in anything. What's the point in living? You work, you build an empire, you build things, you die and give it to somebody who doesn't appreciate what you've done and it all comes into decay and the whole thing is just a downer. <laughs> it, is the, it is the carnal way of looking at things. It's after he departed from his own word. Matter of fact, in my commentary, I wrote on some of the scriptures in Proverbs and I said Solomon would have done well to observe his own writing here. He departed from wisdom and he just started going. He, he changed. He started going with what people were saying and what people thought and how he felt. And so anyway, the book of Ecclesiastes, the majority of it is saying what is untrue, what you shouldn't do. It is showing you the way a lost man, a carnal man, a man who's walked away from God would think. 
But here's the conclusion of it. At the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, verse 13, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. So this is him summarizing the whole thing. He says, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Fear God. And again, fear is talking about trust, honor, reverencing, having love for the Lord, exalting him above anything else. And if you put God first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of those other things will be added unto you. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, a similar thing is said. It says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord. Man, think about this. If you fear the Lord, and if you meet with other people who fear the Lord and talk about the Lord, did you know that God records it in a book? And the scripture says we will be judged during, in the book of Revelation, we will be judged out of the books, not just the book of life, but then the books. There is a book that every time we sit down and talk about the Lord and every time we are seeking the Lord and talking about it and trying to help somebody else or have them help us, did you know that that's written in a book? Man, I want my name in that book. Did you know when you fear the Lord, it says, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another and the Lord hearkened and heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and they that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son and serveth, and serveth him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. You know, again, there's a lot of people that say, well, I love God, and there's people that are I could name names, but there are people, politicians that are sitting here saying, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I love God. And then everything they do is completely contrary to the standards that God gave. Everything they do is against what the word of God says. But th it, this says that when people sit down and talk one to another, when this is what their life is about and they fear God and they are honoring God and they're talking to people about God, this is the focus of their life. God remembers that and writes it down in a book. And that's how you can tell between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. Here's some of the ways that you get the fear of God working in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18 says, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of the law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. This is that instruction I was talking about where God commanded the king to write out the law and he shall write it out and it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. This is instructing you that if you want to fear the Lord, you need to write out a copy of the law. Today we've already got that done. It's the Bible. And we need to read it all of the days of our life that we may learn to fear him. Scripture says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein all the days of thy life. Thou, thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, when you meditate in it day and night, then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Everybody in here wants to be prosperous and have good success, but how often do we meditate in the Word of God? Is the Word of God the standard in our life? Do you compare everything to the Word of God? You know, just think about this. If you were to sit there and everything you read, everything you listen to, songs, everything, if you were to compare it just to the Word of God, and if it didn't match up with the Word of God, you didn't watch it, you didn't listen to it, you didn't read it, you didn't think it, 
I guarantee you, our lives would have to dramatically change. Dramatically change. Matter of fact, John was telling us at lunch that he had some songs that he had to totally throw out because when he got really turned on to the word, he found out that, man, it's not right to beg God and do these things. God's already provided. And it'll change the songs that you sing. It'll change the books that you read. It'll change the movies that you watch. But most of us just, I don't know, we, we don't have this standard. The word of God should be a standard that you compare every thought, every action, everything you see, everything you hear to the word of God. And I can guarantee you there's some people right now that are thinking, if I did that, I'd have to move into a monastery. I'd never know anything. Well, I guarantee you it would dramatically change your life. There's no doubt about it. I don't believe that God wants us to withdraw into a monastery, but man, we could stop a huge amount of unbelief. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 says, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded. Carnal just means having your mind fixed on, stayed upon, or influenced by things that are contrary to what the Word of God says. Spiritually minded is just being controlled by what the Word says. John chapter 6 verse 63, Jesus says, It's the Spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So if you want to be spiritually minded, you be word minded. And if you are spiritually minded, it produces only life and peace. It's impossible for you to die sick thinking spiritually minded because it produces life and peace. It's impossible for you to be depressed. It's impossible for you to be in fear. It's impossible for you to have all of these negative things if you are spiritually minded because all it produces is life and peace. I know that's tight, but it's right. And most people don't believe that and think, well, you can't live that way. Well, don't wake me up because this is how I'm living. <laughs> you know, Josiah, the king, uh, towards the end of uh, Israel's time in the promised land, J Josiah was born at a time it was very, very ungodly. If I'm not mistaken, his father was Manasseh. I think that's correct. And Manasseh was the longest reigning king over Judah. And he actually uh, practiced all kinds of satanic worship and stuff. At the end of his life, he got turned around and came back to the Lord. But he sacrificed his children to demon gods. And he was a very ungodly king. And his son Josiah comes along. And he decided that he was going to reinstate worship of the Lord. And they had forsaken the temple. And so he got the priest to go in and clean out the temple. They had to not only, I mean, they had to take the idols out that his fathers had put in there and they had to cleanse it. And then they had to go through the ceremonial cleansing. And when they came to Josiah, they said, we found this book of the law. And they gave it to Josiah. And when Josiah read it, man, he fell on his face. And he says, if this is God's standards we are in big trouble. And he says, go and find somebody, a prophet that will be able to speak into our life. And they went and found Huldah, the, Huldah, the prophetess. She says in 2 Kings chapter 22. And Huldah prophesied and said, what is written in that book is true. This nation is doomed. It is marked and it's going to be over. But because you humbled yourself, God is going to grant you peace and that you will go to your grave in peace. This goes right along with what Pastor Jerome was teaching this morning about prophecy, having to have something that we do to cooperate with it. This was a word from God and she prophesied that he would die in peace. And it was many years later that Pharaoh came around and skirted Israel and was going up to fight with the Syrians. And Josiah went out with his army and said, you can't pass by my country. I'm going to go fight with you. And Pharaoh told him, says, look, my fight isn't with you. God told me to go fight with these other people. Leave me alone. It's going to be to your own detriment. And Josiah wouldn't listen. And he went out and fought with Pharaoh and got killed in the battle, contrary to the prophecy that was given.
That's exactly what Pastor Jerome was talking about. It was a prophecy from God. And yet, you, there are conditions. You have to meet those conditions. You know, uh, uh, Paul came up with this same thing. He prophesied on his way to Rome that every person on the ship, God had, uh, an angel stood by him and says, I've given you the lives of all of the people on the ship and none of them will perish either. And yet when they found this little island of Mylita, the, some of the guys began to start trying to escape in this lifeboat. Paul found out about it and went to the centurion and said, if these don't stay in the ship, we cannot be saved. And yet he had already prophesied that all of them would live. But he says, if you don't obey what God says, then it won't come to pass. Prophecies are conditional, whether it's obvious, stated or not. But anyway, Josiah, when he heard the reading of the law, man, it caused a fear of God to come in him. And it changed. And they had one of the greatest revivals recorded in scripture because somebody read the word of God and the word of God put the fear of God in this king. That's one of the ways that you get the fear of God. Deuteronomy chapter 31 Verse 11 says, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all of the words of this law and that their children which have not known anything may hear. You know, not much has changed. These young people didn't know anything either. So that your children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. You can learn to fear the Lord of God, your God. The same way that you have to learn to talk, the same way you have to learn to walk and read and to do all kinds of things. The fear of God isn't something that's automatic. You have to teach yourself. You have to learn. And the way you do it is by getting in the word of God. He said, get all of the people together and read these words that they may learn to fear the Lord their God. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This is really important. Some people say, well, I want the fear. I want God to show me these things. And I just don't know why it hadn't happened. He can't get a word in edgewise in between you watching as the stomach turns on television and, and American Idol and all of this other stuff. If you seek for it as you would seek for silver, you will find it. Here's another way of saying it. As long as you can live without a fear of God, then you will. But when you get to where this is a priority and you say, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm not going to live where I just go with whatever the public is saying and whatever the whims of society are. And I can guarantee you, you know, they're now allowing homosexuality, transgenderism, and they're already talking about bestiality. I know some of you think that'll never happen. Ten years ago, nobody would have ever said that they would be pushing transgenderism and teaching all of this stuff in their schools. There's people that are already making the comparison. There is actually some legislation that was introduced that didn't go very far, but they talked about legalizing polygamy. Because if you can have marriage between two men or between two women, well, then why not between three women and all of this stuff? They're talking about doing all of this. And I know many of you think I'm an alarmist, but I guarantee you this. Once you begin this, once you do away with the standard and the fear of God, there is no limit. Satan is going to pull people as far as he possibly can to destroy them. I've actually seen conventions, I've seen pictures of this where people go and they feel that they're animals. And I saw one guy that has had his face surgically altered so that he looked like a cat and he implanted whiskers and he's got stripes tattooed. And there are people that honestly, they're having conventions where thousands of people show up and some believe they're dogs and other cats and stuff. 
This is happening, people. There has to be a standard. There has to be an absolute standard. And you learn it through the Word of God. You adopt what the Word of God says, not what this society says, not what somebody else says. There are absolutes. There are certain things that are unchangeable. Doesn't matter what period we live in. I remember Bill Clinton was criticized because he claimed to be a born-again Christian. And yet everybody knows that he had this, uh, ex, you know, extramarital relationship with Monica Lewinsky and others and things like this. And so one time a person that was interviewing him says, how can you claim to be a Christian and yet have all of these, uh, you know, values that are contrary to the word of God? And what he said was really revealing. He says, you know, the Bible is the word of God, but it was the word for them back thousands of years ago. Things have changed. We have to change with our society. Everything is relative to the day we live in. There's people that believe that. There's people right here in this room that believe that, and that's absolutely wrong. I guarantee you there are certain things that are wrong, and they're going to always be wrong, and it doesn't matter what society does. In Proverbs, I think I just read that one, Proverbs chapter 2. Over here in Deuteronomy chapter 19, says, Then shall ye do unto them as he had thought to have done unto his brothers. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you, and those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more such evil among you. You know what that's talking about? If you were to read Deuteronomy chapter 19, this is talking about when somebody accuses you at the law and takes you to court and if they accuse you of something and you aren't guilty, if they can't prove it, then you do to the person who accused you what they wanted to have done to you. That's in the word of God. Did you know Judge Kavanaugh was accused by some people? of uh, these things that there was no basis for. Matter of fact, there were actually people that were at that same party that said none of this happened. If we were going by the fear of the Lord, if the word of God was controlling our society today, they would have done to those people that accused Judge Kavanaugh and to the people that were in the Senate trial who said that they were against him and they were going to do anything they could to destroy him before any accusations were made and they just jumped on the bandwagon. You know what? They should do to them what they sought to do to Judge Kavanaugh. And the same thing should happen today with the impeachment of President Trump. If we were to go by the word of God, then all of those people that are wanting him impeached, and they said on election day that we are beginning impeachment before he'd done anything. They were just against him. Now, I'm not saying that President Trump does everything right. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But these people were against Trump from the day one, and they've been looking for something, Russian collusion, spent 30-something million dollars. When that didn't pan out, then they jump on a telephone call and this and that and all of these things. You know what? You ought to do to those people what they are seeking to do to President Trump. That's what the Word of God says. <laughs> that's a courtesy clap. But that's what the Scripture says. Man, if we were to do that, that would change some things, you know it? Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 18 says, And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he dies, so that thou shalt put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, I am not advocating that we kill all of our children who are stubborn and rebellious and are drunkard. You know why this was in here, though? Because in the Old Testament, I'm going to have to look this verse up. I'm not sure that I can quote the whole thing, but it's over in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 15. And this is where Saul was being reproved by Samuel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, I'm getting close. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, it says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight 
in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. This says that stubbornness is as witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Today, again, our society has basically just let go of these standards and we expect rebellion from our kids. And it's, it's nearly like a rite of passage. Everybody has to go through this rebellious stage. Rebellion is as witchcraft. It's demonic. There's a lot of Christian parents that wouldn't dare let their kid have seances. You wouldn't dare let them play with Ouija boards, but you'll let them be rebellious. Did you know rebellion is like witchcraft? And stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. And in the Old Testament, what this is saying is it's demonic. It is not just normal. It's demonic. And in the Old Testament, when a person gave in to that and they became demon-possessed, rebellion and stubbornness is demonic, they couldn't be born again. Once a person was given over to being demon-possessed, you had to treat it like a cancer. You had to cut the thing out. You know, cancer, when you get cancer, if you don't get healed, if you go to the medical profession, they're going to cut something out or I think John said carpet bombing. is what they call this radiation treatment and stuff like that. That's the way they deal with it and it hurts you. They cut parts of your body off, which is a terrible thing to do, but it's an attempt to try and get rid of the part that's corrupted so that you save the life of the individual. Well, once a person was given over to demonic stuff in the Old Testament, the only way you could purge it was to kill them, to get rid of it because they couldn't be born again. They couldn't be delivered. Today, we can have people delivered. If your children are rebellious, you don't have to kill them. Praise God, they can be born again. In Acts chapter 13, I believe it's verse 38, it says, those who believe can be purged from all things from which you could not be cleansed under the law of Moses. Do you have that? Acts chapter 13, verse uh, 38, I believe it is. If you could put that up on the screen. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness... believed are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. This is the reason that in, in the Old Testament, God commanded them to go in and kill the men, the women, the children, and the animals. Some people take things like that and say, see, the Bible is just terrible. We don't want to live by that. Well, you put it in context. Today, we can be cleansed. We can be delivered. But in the Old Testament, these people were given over to bestiality. That's the reason he had them go in and kill the animals, because the animals were demon-possessed. They'd been having sex with the animals, the men, the women, the children. It was all demonic. I know some of you think I'm making things up, but you ought to read your Bible. <laughs> if you would read your Bible, you would find out that these people, they, off, they burnt their infants when they were born. They put them on red hot coals and offered them in sacrifices. 
This is what the nations that Israel came in and took over, this is what they were doing. It's not much different than people today that have an abortion and then let the baby just lay there until it dies. It's a similar type of thing. It's demonic. And today we can get people delivered so you don't kill them. But in the Old Testament, you had to treat it like a cancer and you just had to kill them and get rid of it. And it said when you did that, when, what this is talking about is when you execute judgment, our judgment is different today because, but because of Jesus, he bore our sins. People can be changed and stuff. And so you don't kill drug addicts, homosexuals, people who are doing things wrong. You tell them about the goodness of God and they can be born again. But if you don't indulge it, and if you say this is right and this is wrong, and if you stand up against it, it causes the fear of God to fall upon people. We need to have absolute standards. You know, here's a question that I get asked a lot. And they say, well, since we aren't under the law, then should we do away with the Ten Commandments? And I've actually had a lot of grace people come saying, well, we ought to be tearing the Ten Commandments down and people shouldn't be aware of the law. For those who are born again, it says in Hebrews, excuse me, where is this? Romans chapter 10, verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to them who believe. He's the end of the law for righteousness. He didn't say it's the end of the law. The law still exists. It's like gravity. Gravity is here, but now we have thrust and lift and we can fly. But that doesn't do away with gravity. Gravity is still here. And if you don't believe it, turn the engines off and see how long you fly. No, gravity still exists. The law of God still exists. It's not like the law is bad. The law wasn't bad. The law was perfect. The problem with the law was we weren't perfect. And the reason that God gave the law was to wake us up and to show us that the way we are living is wrong so that we would quit indulging and giving in to the devil. We would recognize what sin was and turn away from it. But the law couldn't set us free. All it could do was show you what your need was. So once you get born again, we aren't made righteous in the sight of God by the law. You should not relate to God based on performance. God loves you in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. And so praise God, the Christian does not relate to God by the law, but there's still a benefit to the law. If you wanted to know, you know, your boss tells you to go out and undercut this other person and put down their product and lie about it and put out false information so that everybody will buy your product. And you wonder, should I do this? God, is this what you want me to do? You can go to the law and find out thou shalt not bear false witness and find out that that's no, that's not the way God wants you to live. Now, he's going to love you. Regardless of what you do, if you're truly born again, he's not going to punish you. He's already put punishment upon Jesus. But if you want to know, God, what do you want me to do? Well, the law is perfect and it'll still show you that you don't bear false witness, that you don't do things like that. But for those who aren't born again, the law is especially beneficial because we have the law written in our heart. If we would just follow the love that God gives us, we would never go out and treat anybody wrong. Love would be the fulfilling of the law. But for those that don't know the Lord, man, it's important that we establish that murder... That lying is wrong, stealing is wrong, treating people certain ways is wrong. We need laws. 
And so there is a purpose for the law, even for the believer. In 1 Samuel chapter 11, this is where Saul became king and people didn't honor Samuel. They uh, thought he was too shy. He was actually hiding when they went to anoint him to be king. He was hiding among the stuff and people said, is this going to be the one that rules over us? And they despised him. And then later, one of the cities got surrounded by the enemies and they came and told Saul about it. And it says that the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he took a yoke of oxen and he cut it into 12 pieces and he sent one piece of this oxen to every tribe of Israel. And he, he took a yoke of oxen, this is 1 Samuel eleven seven, and yewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all of the coast of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his, uh, unto his oxen and the fear of the Lord fell on the people and they came out with one consent. In other words, this goes along with the verses that I read earlier, I think it was Thursday night, from Romans chapter 13, that the people that are in positions of authority in government, they bear not the sword in vain and you need to be fearful of them. Government needs to have authority to execute judgment and to correct wrong and to motivate people. And it says here that the fear of the Lord fell on them because of the way that he led. And man, on and on we could go. I don't know. There's so many great things here. Anyway, I'm going to let it go. If you want these, we'll put them on our website or something and you can get this. 17 pages of nothing but scriptures about the fear of the Lord. But you know, I believe that I have a good relationship with the Lord. God loves me. He carries my picture in his wallet. He's got an eight by 10 of me on his mantle. I really do feel like God has just blessed me more than any person on the planet. God is good to me. I love God. I am not afraid of God. I know that he loves me. So I'm not afraid of God in the sense that I'm terrorized by him or fearful that he's going to punish me. But I have a fear of God. I love God more than I love myself. I love God more than I love any other person. I love God more than I love anything that he's given me. I honor him and respect him. And because of it, God's blessings just come upon me and overtake me. I tell you, I have a fear of God in the biblical sense, not a terror, a dread, feeling of uneasiness, but rather I just fear him because I love him so much. He's done so much for me. I'd do anything for him. And every one of us should have that. And when you sit there and say, oh yeah, I love God, but then you won't speak the truth. You don't act the truth. You can use things for entertainment that if Jesus was sitting right next to you, which he's actually closer than that, he's in you. And yet you can sit right there and watch stuff that would be very offensive to him. Things completely contrary to what he died to produce. And you can sit there and use it for entertainment. Something's wrong. That's not good. And I know many of you are thinking, well, man, you quit preaching and you went meddling. <laughs> but I'm telling you, whatever a man fills himself with, that's what's going to dominate you. And we are filling ourselves with the sewage of this world. We're having lies, deception, unbelief fed to us on a daily basis and then wondering why we seem to be having problems. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I go back to that verse, Romans chapter eight, verse six, to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. If you are carnally minded,
thinking the way that the world thinks. Only thing it can produce is death. If you are thinking according to the word of God, the only thing it can produce is life and peace. If you aren't having life and peace, you haven't been spiritually minded. And I'll have people come to me all the time. Oh, that's not true. I do. I keep my mind stayed on the Lord an hour a day. What do you do with the other 12 hours that you're up or whatever? I tell you, Christian life isn't a devotional where you give 15 minutes or 30 minutes a day to the Lord or you go to church once a week. Man, the Christian life is where you just are immersed in your relationship with the Lord. And if you keep your mind stayed upon the Lord, the Lord will keep you in perfect peace. Isaiah 26, 3. If you aren't in perfect peace, your mind's not stayed upon the Lord, period. That's it. Somebody said, oh, well, I know that's true for most people, but you don't understand. I've got a chemical imbalance. No, nope. it says the Lord you keep you in perfect peace if your mind stayed upon him. It doesn't matter about your chemistry or whatever. We've come up with so many excuses. I'm telling you, the word of God will produce a fear of God, a love for God, a reverence, an honor for him where you honor him above anybody or anything else. And if that is not the case with you, I love you, God loves you, but I exhort you that you need to start learning the fear of God. And you do that by getting in the word of God and meditating in it day and night. And you will learn by the examples of other people what happens and you'll see that this behavior is wrong and I need to quit doing that. If I love God, if I honor God, this is the way I'm going to live. One of those verses I use, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 this morning, you perfect holiness in the fear of God. Man, when you begin to fear God, it'll make you start living a holy life. Not out of fear of punishment, but out of love, out of thanksgiving. I commit all of the adultery that I want to commit. I don't want to commit adultery because I love God. I love my wife. I fear God. I won't do stuff like that. Amen. It's not that I'm afraid that God's going to get me. Did you know I could go out and start misappropriating money? I could get into sexual sin. I could do a lot of things. And right now, I've been seeking God for so long. We have so many people that are with me that you know what? Our ministry could continue on for a long time. I could play reruns for a decade. <laughs> and our ministry would continue on for a period of time. God would not hate me. But man, I'm not going to do that because I love God. It's not because I fear that he's going to punish me or do something to me. God's not like that. God loves me. He loves you. But he, I love him so much that, man, I'm not going to live that way. That's what the fear of the Lord is. And I want to encourage you that you need to adopt that attitude. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, Father, we love you, and we are so thankful for what you've done for us. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for us, that he took all of your wrath and all of your punishment against our sin into his own body on the tree, and that he suffered so that we wouldn't have to suffer. Father, thank you so much for what you've done through Jesus. Thank you for being with us here. Thank you for being in these meetings, for empowering our praise and worship. You inhabit the praises of your people. Thank you for letting us feel your presence. Thank you for the people that have been saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit and healed. Thank you for all of these testimonies. Thank you, Father, for all the awesome things that you've done. And Father, I just pray that you would draw people out of love to literally commit their life to you, to quit having one foot in and one foot out. Just like Elijah challenged the people, if God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. Either go for him or go against him. I would that you were hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Father, I pray that you would draw.